We start tonight with that late breaking news that special counsel Jack Smith has subpoenaed former President Donald Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, as part of Smith's investigation into Trump and his role in the January 6th insurrection. Now, I should say this is according to a single source, and it is being reported by CNN. NBC has not yet independently confirmed this reporting. But CNN reports tonight that Meadows received a subpoena for documents and testimony sometime in January. And beyond the fact that subpoenaing a former president's former chief of staff is a huge deal on its own, Mark Meadows in particular is quite a potential witness. Joining me now to discuss all of this and give us his thoughts, FBI general counsel, MSNBC legal analyst, the person that you want to talk to, the person you request desperately to hang out for another hour when breaking news like this happens, Andrew Weissman. It's good to see you, sir. Nice to see you. So are you, are, Mike Pence has a subpoena, Mark Meadows has a subpoena. To some degree, that all makes a lot of sense. What does that tell you about the special counsel's investigation and the alacrity with which Jack Smith appears to be moving? Remember when Jack Smith was appointed and everyone was concerned about how much this was going to slow things down? Yes. And I won't pat myself on the back because I, I know Jack Smith and I was like, uh, quite the opposite. I mean, he is a career guy who doesn't let grass grow under his feet. I mean, he is really, he, you know, just like Robert Mueller, he is really um, steeped in this idea that he has an obligation to go as fast as possible and responsibly. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing. I mean, Mark Meadows makes total sense that you're going to put him in the grand jury for all the reasons you said. I mean, he is a key player and a key witness. He now has four things he can do. He can assert the, the same sort of executive privilege. Yeah. I think that's going to go nowhere very fast. There's Which all, he's tried to do before. He has done that before. And it's by all signs, both the district court and the D.C. Circuit may have already ruled on that issue. So that's really not going to be a winner. He can assert the Fifth Amendment. And then Jack Smith has to make a hard decision about whether he charges him or whether he tries to immunize him. Right. Or he can go in the grand jury. And if he goes in the grand jury and testifies, he can lie or he can tell the truth. Lying is going to be very hard for him to pull that off because there's so many people around him and there's so many documents to confront him. So if you're his lawyer and I've been a defense lawyer, yeah. it, like it is a hard thing. First, you can't counsel somebody to lie. Yeah. Well, and, there's that. Right. And then second, I mean, you're going to get caught. Um, so he could end up getting charged not just with the underlying crimes of, you know, cons seditious conspiracy and obstruction of justice of Congress. Yeah. But he could actually get charged with the lying and obstructing of the grand jury. Yeah. So this is totally the right move if you're Jack Smith. You want Mark Meadows to feel pressure to come clean. Do you think Jack Smith is moving quickly because the judge in this case, Beryl Howell, who has been sort of the judge that's presided over all the Trump scandal, you know her well. Yep is retiring and a new judge is coming in to oversee all of these subpoenas, et cetera. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. Um, <laughs> and the reason is, um, you know, Beryl Howell is, she, she's sort of termed out as the, as the chief judge. I mean, she'll still be a judge, but she won't be in charge of all the grand jury work. But the new judge, um, Bozberg, is also excellent. Um, we dealt with him in the special counsel investigation from time to time. He was sort of the backup judge for um, Judge Howell. So I just don't think that that would be the reason. I think there are many, many reasons in terms of the investigation itself to be moving very quickly. And, you know, Pence and Meadows are sort of They're the, the two. people. Right? I mean, I if mean, I'm a, if I'm a special counsel, right. there are two guys I want to talk right. to. I mean, I, other three, really. Donald Trump is one of them. But right. Mike Pence and Mark Meadows are the guys. I mean, I think yeah. I am old enough to remember the juncture at which Mark Meadows was cooperating with investigations into January 6th, the Congressional Investigation January 6th Committee. He handed over a lot of his text messages, which provided the, I think I can, we can safely say the foundation of so much of the case that, that the committee laid out. Yeah. Everyone at the time was thinking, oh, he's going to fully cooperate. I think this is a sign that, that he didn't, uh, you know, he right. decided not to go down that route. One other sort of technical thing that's kind of interesting is um, Mark Meadows cannot be a target of the grand jury. And the reason I'm saying that is DOJ has a rule, which is that you cannot put a target oh. in the grand jury. So you wouldn't be able to, if, if, for instance, Donald Trump was the target, you wouldn't be able to subpoena him. And it's just an internal DOJ rule. So clearly somebody has decided that 
um, Mark Meadows may be a, what's called a subject. He might be somebody, a, a person of interest, mm -hmm. <laughs> might be a way yes. of referring it to it. But he's not actually somebody who's targeted um, as looking to see whether you could charge him. Um, so that's sort of an interesting call that that because you would think he might be well, yeah. who's so exposed in terms of seeming to be the right hand man of Donald Trump. That urgency could also be heard in calls for action in Florida today, where hundreds of protesters gathered in Tallahassee for another kind of education protest to hold another elected official to account. This week, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis indicated a potential expansion of his decision to ban the new Advanced Placement African American Studies course, which is still in its pilot stage. DeSantis and Florida officials objected to the course's initial inclusion of contemporary themes, black queer studies and black feminism. The College Board has since stripped the course of those, those lesson plans and removed the works of scholars like Bell Hooks, ta Coates, and Kimberly Crenshaw, the woman who coined the term intersectionality. DeSantis is now threatening to sever Florida's relationship with the College Board and its AP courses altogether, potentially replacing all AP courses with other methods of conferring college credit to high school students in the state. Today, protesters marched from Holmes Bethel Missionary Baptist Church to the Capitol building in Tallahassee to say that they have had enough of the governor's so-called war on woke. Led by Reverend Al Sharpton, demonstrators held a rally at the state capitol to save our history and to give the governor a little lesson on American protesting. After 57 years of Jim Crow, it was education. Brown versus the Board of Education that kicked off in 1954 that inspired Rosa Parks to sit down a year later in 1955. If you would study history, Governor, you would have known to mess with us in education always ends to your defeat. You talk about Florida is where woke Die. We went from work to work, yeah. and we will work on you, DeSantis, yeah. until we tell the whole story. Sharpton invoked a long history of civil rights protests in America and how they have moved the needle of progress. And today's demonstration served as a reminder to DeSantis that that pattern of protest and progress will continue, no matter how many history courses and books he tries to ban. In the meantime, there are still classroom libraries that have been papered over, subject matter that has been banned from classrooms, AP classes that are unavailable in the state of Florida, and the war on woke expanding nationwide. Joining us now is the renowned scholar and writer Kimberly Crenshaw. She is a professor of law at Columbia and the University of California and, of course, executive director of the African American Policy Forum. Uh, professor Crenshaw is a critical race pioneer, literally the person who's at the center of so many of these debates who coined the term intersectionality, which is a word that describes how race and gender and class and other traits intertwine. And both CRT and intersectionality have been removed from that new AP uh, African American Studies course by the College Board down in Florida. Professor Crenshaw, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here tonight. Apologies for the long introduction, but we felt it was <laughs> important. Um, let me first just ask you about this term culture war, because the idea of a culture war implies that there are these two sides battling it out. But what this feels like is much more asymmetric. It feels much more like an attack. Do you think we need to refrain, reframe how we are talking about what is going on, courtesy of Governor DeSantis and other Republicans who are waging this battle. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Alex. And in fact, one of my uh, good friends, Jason Stanley, just wrote an op-ed in yesterday's Guardian arguing precisely that. To call this a culture war is not only a misnomer, it is uh, actually, disinformation, people aren't being told exactly what is happening. So you're right to point out the asymmetry uh, of this. You're right to point out that, you know, a culture war is is often a, a war of values. Uh, it, it can be, you know, uh, warring op-eds. It's not a faction that basically takes the law 
in its own hands and determines that there are ideas, there are practices, there are policies, there are interests that can no longer be legally expressed in public institutions. That's what DeSantis has done, and that's what upwards of 17 states have done across the country, pursuing what they consider this anti-wokeness uh, crusade. What it actually is, Alex, is a uh, retrenchment. It is a reaction. It is a response to the tremendous mobilization that happened in 2020 uh, in response to the killing of Breonna Taylor, uh, of, of, of George Floyd. And frankly, I think the fear uh, that many people saw when in every state, there was a massive protest that involved people of all ages and all races. Anti-racism was becoming a majoritarian value that was demanding people to pay attention, not to just individuals who are racist, but to institutions and structures. And that's precisely why the backlash has gone after the frameworks that allow people to understand our history in order to change our present. Yeah, I think we have a copy of some of the op-ed that you mentioned, and I think it bears reading an excerpt from it. The passing of these laws signals the dawn of a new authoritarian age in the United States, where the state uses laws restricting speech to intimidate, bully, and punish educators, forcing them to submit to the ideology of the dominant majority or lose their livelihoods and even their freedom. My question to you is, you use the word retrenchment just now, and to I, I would love if you could sort of frame up the tradition that this fits into in America, because I think that there was a contentment for at least some years, maybe in the early aughts or the mid, the mid, the mid aughts. I don't even know, the early part of the 21st century where, where it felt like these issues had been litigated. But this feels so retrograde, so very much in line with an America that is not 40 years old, but 150 years old, like Civil War America. That's where it feels like, at least from my vantage point, we are at. How do you contextualize this in terms of American history? Well, let's elevate some some concepts or some uh, sound bites that sound like they came from the 19th century, right? We've got uh, states' rights. People are basically making arguments that uh, our states' rights allow us to say that there are certain ideas that cannot be taught about your history. Uh, the idea that white rights trump uh, black realities, that white emotions and comfort are more important than access and equity to black people and other people of color. I mean, these ideas are old, old ideas. They're ideas um, that basically suggest that your civil rights violate my civil rights. And there can only be my civil rights. So basically, you don't get a chance to, to have your history told. You don't get a chance to vote for the people you want to vote for. You don't get a chance to be full 100% uh, citizens of this country. And the reality is that black freedom, freedom of people of color, has always been a divisive concept. The very effort to actually create laws that eliminate the ability to advocate and to learn about racial justice under divisive concepts, that tells you everything you need to know about how retrograde this moment and this movement actually is. Critical race theory pioneer, writer, scholar, the woman at the center literally of all of this, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, please come back to this show all the time. We will ask you to speak extemporaneously for long periods of time. We will never censor anything you have to say. All words are allowed. Um, we really appreciate your time and efforts. Thanks for joining and, us today. And Alex, if I may, I just want to tell people the, that black scholars have a, a new petition called a call to the college board to restore the integrity of AP courses. They'll be able to see it tomorrow on Medium. We will be looking out for that. Thank you for the heads up, Professor. It is now February of the year 2023, but election denialism is still very much alive and well. And with the prospect of a presidential election on the horizon, it has the potential to get worse. 
To confront the hundreds of election deniers who are still out there, elections officials across the country are now leading the charge to combat misinformation about election integrity. According to the Washington Post, in Arizona, the new Democratic attorney general has repurposed a unit that, under her predecessor, focused on election fraud, and it will now focus on voting rights and ballot access. In Michigan, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson is working to toughen penalties against those who threaten elections officials. Benson is also drafting legislation that would make it a crime to knowingly spread misinformation about elections, comparing the legislation to laws barring deceptive marketing practices. The way Benson sees it, individuals who intentionally spread misinformation that then leads to threats, or worse, targeting elections officials, are just as culpable and should be held culpable just as those who are actually exercising the threats themselves. Down in North Carolina, the Board of Elections is considering the removal of county elections official who, without evidence of irregularities, refused to certify the 2022 midterm results. After more than two years of unabashed election denialism, the cavalry is coming to combat the big lie at the state level, which, if you like democracy, is highly anticipated and also probably very good news. Joining us now to help us figure out whether it is indeed good news is Mark Elias, voting rights attorney and founder of Democracy Docket. Mark, thanks for making the time. Um, how heartened are you by these measures that are being announced at the state level across the country? So look, I think they're an important first step, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. As you said, we have been having election denialism for two years, and at each stage, we have thought, well, it will get better. You know, after Donald Trump loses, it'll get better. After he litigates his 65 cases and loses them, it'll get better. Certainly after Republicans witness the, the violent insurrection at the nation's capital, the fever will break and it will get better. After they lose the midterms, it has to get better. But the fact is, it's not getting better. So I am happy to see that Democratic election officials and Democratic office holders are pushing back. But I think we need to be very realistic about the threats that we face. They are persistent, they are escalating, and they are coming from one side of the aisle. What about, I mean, enforcing some of these laws? First, there's a question of how you enforce them, right? Like it, Benson's uh, legislation making it a crime to knowingly spread misinformation about elections. Is that enforceable? And then there's the sort of counter argument that the more you punish folks like this, the more a kind of almost, the more it makes them dig in their heels, right? The more, at least when you talk about misinformation on social media, you, you try and, you try and censor it, you try and, you know, prevent it from spreading and it, and the virus finds its way to another host. So, I mean, when we talk about efficacy, yeah. where do you grade these things? Yeah. So look, I think that the, it's hard for me to address the speech content stuff because it is tricky with the First Amendment. I'd want to see what the text are. But there mm -hmm. are things that we can do to really push back against an election denialism. You know, you said that there that the bill is aimed at people who provide misinformation. It's not people. It's Republicans. The election official in, in North Carolina was a Republican. Like, we need to be able to acknowledge that this is a not a bipartisan problem. The problem we have is that one party is hijacking a system of elections that rely on bipartisanship, right? They rely on Democrats and Republicans certifying elections together. They rely on Democrats and Republicans observing elections together. And they assume that at the end of the day, everyone has a common interest in seeing that the accurate results are tabulated and certified and put forward. But that just isn't the case. So the measures I think we need to focus on are the ones that are that that sort of do away with the nostalgia of the pageantry of democracy that once was and focuses on the challenges of democracy that are today. They focus on making sure that county officials have to certify elections whether they like the results or not. And if they don't, they will get sued. And if necessary, they will go to jail. Like, we need to be much more intentional about bringing to bear the, the resources and the, the, the steps necessary to enforce the laws to make sure every ballot is counted and accurately certified. Do you think at this point it matters if any of these um, new laws are put into place? that any of them have Republican support. Does that matter at this point if you have a Republican uh, state attorney general uh, or attorney general that is, is willing to sort of go out on a limb here and try and reform a broken system as far as the party and misinformation? No. 
I don't. And that's actually one of the things that, that is always frustrating to me. Right now, Alex, as we sit here, there are 17 states. More than half of the American public lives in a state that is where that has a Democratic trifecta, which means it's a Democratic governor and Democratic legislature. Those legislatures and governors can act uh, in concert to implement these provisions. They won't target target every um, battleground state, every swing state, but they will create a momentum and a standard just in the way in which DeSantis and his cronies have acted in partisan fashion to create standards on the other side. So I don't think we should be wringing our hands trying to find some magical unicorn Republican. We should be moving forward with the business at hand. There are no unicorns. Mark Elias, thank you for joining us tonight. Appreciate your time. Thank you.